want to give you this message today, which is part of my theme. And for those who may be watching on mygladtidings.org, I want this message to go to you also. This is a message that I really enjoy to preach once in a blue moon, but it is something that we are looking forward to. And I'm grateful that we're looking forward to this wonderful, great day. It's called, my message, the theme is, the comfort and the assurance of his coming. The comfort and assurance of his coming. And I'm grateful again that he is coming back. One of these days. And I'm grateful this morning that I can give you this message. And I hope it encourages you and those who may be watching on mygladtidings.org. This message goes to you also. We're recording this for you. And I know that you will be blessed by this. If you want to give to this ministry, go to mygladtidings.org. And there's a giving site if you want to give to this ministry. If It blesses you. But this message goes to you also too. And for all of you seasoned saints, all of you newbies, I want you to have this message. The comfort and insurance are of his coming. We're going to be in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. And this should be a familiar passage to some of you, or all of you, hopefully. If you don't read this message from time to time, this, uh, this passage of scripture, which is very, very, very poignant and very encouraging. First Thessalonians four thirteen through 18, it says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Who believes that today? For this we say to you by the word of God, word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will be by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. To meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. What a great passage of scripture. Father, we thank you this morning. Honor you and thank you for this day you made. Thank you for giving us this day. And thank you, Lord, for your presence and your Holy Spirit in this house. Lord, I honor you and thank you for this message that we're about to give to your people, whether they're here or whether they're listening. Father, I know that you're coming back. And we ask you, Father, that you will encourage deliver every listener today, whether they're in this house, whether they're seasoned saints, or they're new to Christ, or they don't even know Christ, Lord. I pray that they come to this, to your, to, to your will, come to your heart. Let them into your heart today, Father. I ask you, Jesus, that you will bless this message, Lord, that it will encourage the hearer. Lord, bless these lips of clay. As I give this message, Lord Jesus, I give it out from the bottom of my heart. But Lord, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you guide my lips with your holy presence and Holy Spirit. As I talk about your coming back. I give you thanks, glory, and honor. I don't preach in my own strength, but I preach in yours. And Father, I just thank you, Father. Because I love all of these folks, Lord. I love all these people. But Father, you love them even more. And I thank you, Father, in your precious name. Amen. First Thessalonians was written to a group of young believers. These people had, all, had only been saved for a few months. And, and they were suffering intense 
persecution for their faith. I want you to know this today. Because they were so young in the Lord, they were confused about a number of matters. So Paul wrote to them to help them grow in their faith. And in this great book, Paul confronts their doubts, and he challenges them to move to a closer and cleaner walk with the Lord. And he answered the questions they have about several areas of faith. And among the topics Paul discusses is the second coming of the Lord Jesus. The Thessalonians possess some fears regarding the Lord's coming, and Paul addresses these concerns with these verses. Paul lets them know that the coming of Jesus is not an event that should bring fear to the heart of believers. He wants them to know that the return of Jesus Christ is for his church and is an event that should comfort the hearts of those who know Jesus. And the fact that of our Lord's second coming should comfort our hearts as well today. I know there's a lot of crazy and some foolish and some outlandish teachings out there regarding the Lord's coming. And I, don't, I do not claim to have all the answers, but I'm willing to take the Bible word for word. Mm -hmm. And at face value, and these verses, and, and point out a few concepts and truths that are revealed here. That's why I want to preach on the comfort and assurance of his coming. Let me show you why believers can have hope in the reality, yes, and aspect of our Lord's return. And if you're watching and listening today, be encouraged by this message today. Whether you are a house of God or listening outside of this house, be encouraged today. Whether you're a seasoned Christian or not, know that one day our great Savior will come again and take his church home. Do you believe that today? Then read verses 13 through 15 again. We're going to talk about a resurrection. He says, but, it, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow, as many who have no hope, as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. We're going to talk about a resurrection here. Among the fears of the Thessalonians was that their departed loved ones had missed the second coming. And they were afraid that their dead, that, that their, their, that their dead had missed the rapture and, and, and would not be raised until after the tribulation. Or that their dead loved ones might, not, might, not be, might be second class citizens in heaven. Paul gives, this, gives them this much needed information about this matter. Now, when Paul says the word ignorant, in this sense, he means that they were misinformed, okay? They were misinformed. See, death is not what we think it is. Paul calls it sleep. This does not mean that the soul sleeps. That is a false doctrine. The word sleep is a euphemism for death. And when we fall asleep at night, we lose consciousness, but we do not cease to exist. And see, those who die in Jesus lose their conscience presence in this world, but they do not cease to exist. The phrase in verse 14, God will bring with him, makes it clear that they continue to exist with God in heaven. The metaphor of sleep is, is precious. You know why? Because the phrase, uh, those who sleep in Jesus can be translate, translated, them which Jesus puts to sleep. And in this image of a loving parent rocking a child to sleep, this is just what the Lord does. He comes for his own and gently rocks them to sleep. 
John 14, 1 through 3, you know this, 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 this verse, this chapter. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, but also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I, I will come again. Here's the thing. I will come again and receive you to myself. Where I am, there you may be also. See, death is merely the departure of the soul from the life into heaven above. 2 Timothy 4 and 8 says, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. So, so where does our hope in the face of death come from? Two sources. The death of Christ on the cross and the resurrection from Jesus from the dead. And when the Bible speaks of the death of Jesus, it, it does not use the word sleep. Jesus was not gently rocked to sleep. He endured the full force of death for his elect. And when Jesus died, he, he endured the full wrath of God for our sins, and he, by his death, took away forever the sting of death for his saints. Praise God. And not only does his death give us hope, so does his resurrection. Because Jesus rose from the dead, and all those who have faith in him will rise again. Because Jesus died and rose again, we, we not need to fear death or his judgment or God's judgment. God has accepted Jesus for our ransom, and in him we are delivered from sin. His wrath from his death and also from his judgment. So let me tell you, when you come to a funeral or, or home going, of a saint and follow a body to the grave, we're not saying goodbye to those we love. We're merely saying, I'll meet you in the morning. They have gone to be with Jesus and we will see them again. We'll see them again some golden daybreak. My pastor used to say that. And that is a comforting word. Someday there, there's going to be a great getting up morning, folks. One day real soon. Who believes that today? And you know what? He knows where all the bodies are. Let me just get to you. He knows, he knows where all the bodies are. Every mass grave in the world, the total destruction of bodies, those lost at sea, etc. He knows where every molecule and atom of every single person is and located and where and they will get up again. In, verses 15, in verse 15, Paul tells us that those who are still alive when Jesus comes will by no means precede those who are asleep. The word proceed means to prevent. In other words, when the Lord comes for his people, the living saints will not receive preferential treatment. Those who are alive will not stand in the way of the Lord's ministry to the dead. Those who have died in the faith will not miss out on the rapture of the church. So to die in Jesus is not to miss out on anything. To die in Jesus means that you get to enter in his presence before the rest of us. It means that you will wait with him until he returns for the rest of his people. And that is a comforting word. Let me read verses 16 and 17 here. Praise God. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout, and with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be called up together with him in the clouds to meet him, meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Let's talk about a rapture here. You know, these verses talk about the rapture of the church. And this is a doctrine that, may, that many people reject because it seems, but, but it seems like Paul believed and I believe it too. 
It seems that Paul was looking for the forthcoming return of the Lord Jesus on his day. And we look for the forthcoming return of our Savior even today. See, those who reject the doctrine of the rapture say, well, well, say that the rapture isn't in the Bible. They are right, but the word grandfather is, isn't, and you, we believe in him. Don't we? The word trinity is not there either. But if you reject that one, you'll go to hell. The word rapture translates the Latin word rapto or raptus. It is a word that means to seize for oneself. The word rapture is the Latin translation of the Greek word harpezo, which is translated in verse 17 as caught up. Paul tells us that those who are alive when the rapture comes shall be caught up. This phrase comes from a word that refers to a strong, irresistible, violent act. It literally means to seize by force, to carry off by force, to claim for oneself eagerly. In the rapture, the Lord Jesus will claim his bride by force. It is interesting to know that the word conveys the ideal of force. And certainly there is within the heart of the redeemed to desire to depart and go to heaven. However, there are forces that will hinder our departure. There is. And that's if they could. Among them are among the pools of sin, the influence of the flesh, the world, and the devil. All these will conspire to keep us here. And when he comes, there will be no staying here. He will catch away that which he has redeemed by his blood, and he will take them home to glory. Praise God, no force will be able to prevent his coming for us. No force will be able to hold us here when he does come. The bottom line is this. When he comes, we're gone for good up to glory. Praise God. That makes me happy myself. So how will this event take place? We are told that Jesus himself will come in the clouds above this earth. He will shout, the archangel will lift his voice, and there will be a blast from a trumpet. Let's look at these events for a moment. First, there will be a shout. This refers to a military command. Jesus is calling the host of heaven to assemble for military action against the domain of the enemy. The air, mm -hmm. the domain, the enemy, which is, other, uh, which is his domain, the air. Now, if you look at verse 17, Jesus will stop in the air. The air is the domain of the devil. Jesus will invade the devil's very territory. He will stop there and call his bride to come up and meet him. This is a clear demonstration of our Lord's power over Satan. And of course, this shout has another emphasis too. Jesus promised that there would come a day when the dead would hear his voice. John 5 and 25 says this, he says, Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. It was this shout that was heard by Lazarus, even in the death that brought him back to life. And I'm not sure of the reason, but an archangel will add his voice to the voice of the Lord. Listen, that's some loud and powerful shouting that can raise the dead. And then there be a trumpet. Throughout Jewish history, the trumpet was used for many reasons to announce feast. To announce various celebrations, to, to, to announce sacred assembly, to sound an alarm during a time of war. They use a trumpet to assemble a crowd. They use one to make an announcement. They use one to, to notify the people that it was time to break camp and move. And there's a twofold purpose here with this trumpet, even with us. The trumpet will be a symbol of the people of God. 
to signal their deliverance. And to call them to move out. This is a receiver set to a specific frequency or tone that only they could hear. The Lord's trumpet is calling his people to fall in and prepare to move out. And when Paul talks about the rapture of the church, he uses the word we. In the New King James Version, he uses the word we in the verses 15 and 17. He uses it four times. Who is he talking about? Who would get to go in the rapture? He mentions two groups, the dead in Christ and we who are alive and remain. And in both cases, he's referring to believers or those who are saved by the grace of God. The rapture is not for everybody, but the rapture is for those who are in a personal faith relationship with Jesus Christ. It's like a magnet. It only attracts things with a similar nature. Jesus is only coming for those who possess his nature. This nature is given at the new birth. Praise God. This is a comforting word for you. Let me read verses 17 and 18. Then we who are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Paul tells us that we will be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. This verse reminds us that the day of our rapture will be one day of our reunion. Our reunions will be twofold on this day. We will meet those, first one, we will meet those who have gone before us in death. Spouses, children, parents, and loved ones will meet again, again in the clouds above the earth. That meeting, that meeting will be far different than our partings. Our partings here are marked by sadness and fear of the unknown future. These verses take the fear out of the future. The Lord tells us that we can be confident that we will meet our loved ones again. And when we do, they and we will be far different than the last time we met. And what changes will we see? There will be no sin, no sickness, no weakness, no disease, no pain. No death, etc. Revelations 21 and 4 says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And someone asked, Can it get better than yet? Yes, it can. It can get better than that. You know why? Because we're going to meet the Lord also. Do you comprehend what Paul is saying here? One day, you and I will either be raised from the dead or raptured. Either way, we will be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. On that glorious day, we will look on the Lord who died for us on the cross. The one who loved us so much that he left heaven above and endured the countless sufferings to redeem us. We will meet the one who conquered death, hell, and the grave. We will meet the one who loved us in spite of ourselves and our sins. We're going to see him. We're going to see him, folks. All those things, death and sin and everything else is going to be gone. But, but, but what's better? We're going to see God. We're going to see him. And I don't know about you, but that cranks my engine, folks. That, that it stirs my heart to know that one day, whether I leave here by the clouds or the clods, I will stand completed in the image of his presence with a new body. I just wanted to throw that in. And according to this verse, that is a condition that will never change. Oh, hallelujah. Because Paul says, 
And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Jesus is what will make heaven, heaven. Wherever he is, is heaven. It's heaven already. Imagine what it will be like when we see him face to face. Imagine what it will be like to hear his voice. Imagine what it will be like to feel his touch. Imagine what it will be like to be able to bow at his feet and thank him for the cross. To thank him for the shedding of his blood. To thank him for the empty tomb and rising in victory for us. For giving us his word, the Bible. For leaving us the Holy Ghost so we would not be left as orphans. To thank him for the church. To thank him for the blessings of life. To thank him for his awesome and marvelous presence. And all the countless other things he does for us. We get to see him. I'm trying to imagine it, but I can't imagine it. But I'm imagining it. Knowing that we're going to see him. We're going to see him. Hallelujah. We're going to see him, folks. Come on, folks. We're going to see him. One day we're going to see our Savior up in that air as we're raptured up or the dead in Christ we're going to see him and witness and be in his presence let me end today if you're watching and listening verse 18 tells us this the last part of that he says comfort one another with these words. Does the thought of the Lord's coming comfort your heart? It, it sure does mine. Paul is telling us to remind one another. That this life with all this pain, sorrows and problems. Are merely a temporary existence. He tells us to find our hope. Our comfort and our encouragement. In the coming Jesus. The coming of Jesus. Some of you today who may be walking through some tight places today. But let me remind you that the Lord is coming. Yeah. Jesus is coming, folks. And not a single thing that plagues you will, that plagues you here, will follow you there. That comforts my heart today. How about you? If you have any needs, Jesus is the solution. Are you lost? He's the Savior. Are you weary? He will be your strength. Are you excited about his coming? And if you have the right relationship with our Savior, Jesus, today, then you should be living and looking towards the day of his great return. Someone say this with me. What a day that will be. Ah, come on, say it again. What a day that will be. What a day that will be. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we're going to sing and what? Shout the victory. We're going to sing. We're going to shout the victory. When we all see Jesus, what a day of rejoicing that's going to be. Oh, my God. Hallelujah. His great return is coming. Let me talk to you, those who are watching and listening today, are you in the house? Are you faithful when you think, are you fearful? And put it this way. You may not be faithful, but are you fearful when you think of his coming back? If you are, then it's a time to examine your relationship with Jesus. If you're saved and you know that you are, there should be no fear of his coming back. 
If you're listening today, can you truly say that you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior today? You know, on that great day, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Forgive me. Thank you, Lord. On that great day, the great trumpet of the Lord is going to sound. Do you have the confidence to know that you will hear the sound of that horn? Do you know for sure that you will be part of that great number that will unite it with our, be united with our Savior, Jesus, on that great day of the Lord? If not, then it's time. It's time to, 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 to fully surrender your life to our Lord today. Jesus is coming soon. It could be sooner than you think. He can come in the next hour. Will you be ready? If not, it's time to invite him into your heart and say yes to his will and yes to his way. As I say, sometimes our Savior can make the difference in your life and his guidance and peace that will give you the confidence to know that you are headed to heaven. He can give you that today. I thank God for his guidance today in my life. We cannot live without Jesus in our hearts today, in our lives today. I know I can't. I can't. As saints of God, we need him. I need him every day, and do you, you do too. So why don't you open up your heart to Jesus and ask him into your life today? Don't wait for tomorrow. If you're watching and listening, don't wait for tomorrow. And don't hesitate in your decision before tomorrow. Because tomorrow is not promised to you. The next hour is not promised to us. Stop putting it off before it's too late. Our Savior is going to come through that cloud with a shout. And we all need to be ready. He doesn't want us to see hell's fire. You know, if heaven is your goal, then it's time to get right with God. Do it today. Do it today. So why don't you meet him now? Because you don't want to meet him later. And again, I thank the Lord Jesus today for his coming back. I don't have no fear of his coming because I know I'm going to be ready. And if you know that you're going to be ready, you have no fear. Raise those hands in this house today. If you know it, if you know it, you know for sure. If you know for sure, raise both hands if you know for sure. I know for sure. I know for sure. If I don't have any fear, and I'm looking for him to come back. But if you're listening today on mygladtidings.org, if you're listening today, if you're not sure, if you have fear, you need to examine your walk with God. And I ask you today, if you have fear, do you need to be saved? And if you do, make a decision for him today, right now. Let me give you a moment. If you're listening, Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. He gave his life for you. He took your sins upon his shoulders, past, present, and future. And he put it on his, on his shoulders because he loves you and you're precious in his sight. All of us are. And I pray you make the right decision today. And if you did, I want you to bow your heads with me. Everyone in this house, bow your heads with me. And as we pray, pray for your loved ones. Pray for those who need saving. Because the great trumpet and shout of Jesus is going to come. And we want everyone to be ready. There's enough room in heaven for everyone who wants to be with Jesus. So if you decide to give your heart over to Jesus, say this with me and everyone in this house, say this with me. Dear Jesus, I thank you for this time you've given me to give my life over to you. I made the decision to let you into my heart to give you my life, to save my life. And Father, I ask you, 
that you will make my life whole, that you will give my life purpose and meaning. And I want you, Lord, to have full reign over my life. Make me a new Christian. Make me a new person in you. Give me purpose, Father, because I can't live without you. I need you, Lord, in my heart, in my mind, and in my soul. Father, I believe that you died on the cross and you rose again on the third day. And I thank you for that. So now I ask you, Father, forgive me of my sins and my shame. Forgive me for being slack. And I know, Father, that you will forgive my sins and you will forget them. And I thank you, Father. I know from a shadow of a doubt that you will save me and you have saved me. I thank you, Father, because I know right now, I feel right now that you've forgiven me of my sins and I know I'm saved. I believe I'm saved. And without a shadow of a doubt, I am saved. And I thank you for saving me in your precious name. Amen. Amen. God, give, give God a hand praise today. Give God a hand praise. Hallelujah.